The reading is taken from 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 to 11. I'm reading from the Good News version, but in the Pew Bible it is on page 1155. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 to 11. And now I want to remind you, my brothers and sisters, of the good news which I preached to you, which you received, and on which your faith stands firm. That is the gospel, the message that I preach to you. You are saved by the gospel if you hold firmly to it, unless it was for nothing that you believed. I passed on to you what I received, which is of the greatest importance, that Christ had died for our sins as written in the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised to life three days later as written in the scriptures, that he appeared to Peter and then to all 12 apostles, then he appeared to more than 600 of his followers at once, most of whom are still alive, although some have died. Then he appeared to James and afterwards to all the apostles. Last of all, he appeared also to me, even though I am like someone whose birth was abnormal, for I am the least of all the apostles. I do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted God's church. But by God's grace I am what I am, and the grace that he gave me was not without effect. On the contrary, I have worked harder than any of the other apostles, although it was not really my own doing, but God's grace working with me. So then, whether it came from me or from them, this is what we all preach, and this is what you believe. Thanks very much. It is it's great to celebrate on Easter Day. It seemed a natural thing to do. We have this sense that Jesus was dead and Jesus is alive. It fits in very well with the, the whole pattern of the year, with new life, with more light and sunshine and warmth. And the rain's even held off to make the point this morning, which is, which is brilliant. But I, I don't know about you, I just think at the outset, very often I can, in a celebration, feel excited and interested and I only have a vague feeling of why I'm excited and interested. It must be good news that Jesus was dead and is alive. But St. Paul says this is the basis of the gospel. He says this is what we all preach and this is what you believe. Without the resurrection of Jesus, there is no Christianity. As he says just a few verses later on, if Christ has not been raised from death, then we have nothing to preach and you have nothing to believe. I have nothing to preach, and you have nothing to believe. And at the outset of our celebrations this morning, what is it that we are excited about? Because Jesus was raised from the dead, because of the resurrection, we know, first of all, that the cross works. We know that it wasn't just a great sacrifice, but Jesus went down with the ship. We know that our sins can be forgiven that this great project of God for the salvation of mankind has come off. We know that. When the angel comes and rolls the stone away, it is not so that Jesus can get out, it's so that we can see in. It's so that we know that the cross works and our sins can be forgiven. That is good news. Two, we know that Jesus is exactly who he said he was. He was not just someone sent from God. He was not just a sort of a, a representative and he was certainly not just a human role model. Jesus is the Son of God, fully divine. It's him who does resurrection. We know because of the resurrection that he is who he said he was. Three, we know that because he, he comes amongst his first disciples, Jesus is with us now. He may have triumphed on the cross and returned to heaven and you would not know. But we do know, and we know that Jesus is here with us. And for as St. Paul wraps it up, we can be forgiven for our sins, we can be born again in Jesus, and we know that we can have eternal life, that we have resurrection as well as Jesus. The cross works. Jesus is who he says he is. Jesus is with us, and we can have eternal life. That, those are grounds for celebration. Let's stand and sing. He is risen, he is risen, Jesus is alive.
I'd like to read for you this morning the uh, resurrection narrative this year from the end of St. Matthew's Gospel, Matthew 28. After the Sabbath, as Sunday morning was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. Suddenly, there was a violent earthquake. An angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled the stone away, and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid that they trembled and became like dead men. The angel spoke to the women. You must not be afraid, he said. I know that you are looking for Jesus who, were cru who was crucified. He is not here. He has been raised, just as he said. Come here and see the place where he was lying. Go quickly now and tell his disciples he has been raised from death and now he is going to Galilee ahead of you. There you will see him. Remember what I have told you. So they left the tomb in a hurry, afraid, <clears throat> and yet filled with joy, and ran to tell the disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them and said, Peace be with you. They came up to him, took hold of his feet, and worshipped him. Do not be afraid, Jesus said to them. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. While the women went on their way, some of the soldiers guarding the tomb went back to the city and told the chief priests everything that had happened. The chief priests met with the elders and made their plan. They gave a large sum of money to the soldiers and said, You are to say that his disciples came during the night and stole his body while you were asleep. And if the governor should hear of this, we will convince him that you are innocent and you will have nothing to worry about. And the guards took the money and did what they were told to do. And so that is the report spread round by the Jews to this very day. But the eleven disciples went to the hill in Galilee where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, even though some of them doubted. And Jesus drew near and said to them, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Go then to all people everywhere, and make them my disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you, and I will be with you always to the end of the age. Amidst all the story, all the detail, and all the significance, just one verse for you, just to meditate and think on today. They came up to him, took hold of his feet and worshipped him. They came up to him, took hold of his feet and worshipped him. I just got that, uh, just thinking about those women. They, they meet with Jesus and they touch him. They touch his feet. In antiquity, in ancient times, ghosts were notable for lots of detail, but for having no feet. <laughs> There is a tangibility, a realness, a physicalness. They touched him. There's not a problem here of doubt, as with Thomas. They just touch him. They just touch him. This is a historic event. This is a real Jesus. This is not any sort of spiritualized Jesus that some people may not believe in. The resurrection is a historic event. And Jesus is absolutely real. So is the empty tomb. Believe not what certain church leaders have said and certain so-called academics, that it really doesn't matter about the empty tomb. It does matter about the empty tomb. I have a garage at home. It either has my car in it or it does not have my car in it. When the car is not in it, it is empty. Jesus is either in the tomb or he's somewhere else. The empty tomb is important. That's why that wonderful little bit where the angel comes, almost with a degree of swagger, certainly with a degree of panache, and the angel came down and rolled the stone away and sat on it. <laughs> you know, 
that sense of so much for the guards and the seal and the Roman Empire and Caesar, well, that's that then. So that you can see inside. If God thinks it's important that we should see there's an empty tomb, it is important that there's an empty tomb. It is a physical fact. And put together, we have this historic event which is just as real as the Battle of Hastings. It's just as real as the White Cliffs of Dover. It's just as real as the London Olympics. It's just as real as the Russians being in the Ukraine. It's just as real as the mess down there on the prom. It is real. Not kind of real in a religious way. They touched his feet. But the empty tomb is not enough. So Matthew makes, it, makes the point, doesn't he, that you need the empty tomb, but you don't. We are empty tomb people. We are resurrected Jesus people. And although they believed in the empty tomb, when they went and told the authorities that this has happened, the angel had come because they'd been there, if you don't want to believe it, you won't believe it. Whatever happens, and many of your friends will not believe it. Whatever happens, whatever the evidence, and any historian, and many of them have done it, and whatever the legal mind, and many have done that, have looked at this evidence, there is no shadow of doubt that it had to be a resurrection. There is no reasonable reason for anything else to happen. And yet people do not want to believe it. They said, you were as, tell them you were asleep, which means you could be executed for being on guard and asleep. And then they said, so as to be sort of really credible, when you were asleep, you saw them come and take him away. <laughs> there are people around us who will believe this kind of thing just because Dawkins said so. We don't have to believe this rubbish. This is for true. This is for real. Jesus comes out of an empty tomb. But for those, those not just the opposition, those ladies, they saw the tomb, they were aghast. The angel spoke to them, they were joyful but terrified. It was when they touched Jesus that it all came together. It will not do just to be an empty tomb person here this morning. And it will not do just to believe in the story. You may be excited, you may be filled with joy, but what changes your life is when you touch Jesus. Closer than hands and feet post-ascension, post-Pentecost, spiritually, but just as tangibly, in fact, more real, to touch Jesus. They touched his feet. But i just say two things to finish on this touch. Two things which are in slight tension. I think when they touched his feet, they must have realised that he was standing on them. I, without being trivial about these, these feet had had a very hard time. They'd been dragged through Jerusalem carrying this cross and collapsed under the weight of it when he fell down. They'd been nailed to a cross and then torn apart by the weight as Jesus' body collapsed onto it. They had then been taken down, bound in cloths, carried and laid in a tomb like this. But now Jesus is back on his feet and Jesus is on the move. I always like that phrase from C.S. Lewis in The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, Aslan is on the move. Well, when they come here and he's on his feet, he is on the move. And indeed, the resurrection story is all about movement, isn't it? Jesus moves, he goes, and they are sent. Now he says to the women, go into Galilee and tell my disciples to meet me there. We read when he got there, he was there, he met them. And he said, go into the whole world and I will be with you in all the world. This is not static. Too often, our celebration of Easter, my celebration of Easter, is that Jesus meets us in the garden, rustles up a few nice garden chairs, and we all sit round for an Easter garden party and are so relieved that Jesus is not dead that we sit around all afternoon. This is not in the story. They are on the move. We follow where his feet have trod. And if you're a busy Christian, that's what you want to do. But it is in with tension with just the final thing. And that is that they worshipped him as they touched his feet. You can't really do that without kneeling down. 
they knelt, they held his feet, and they worshipped. And at that point, they don't tell anybody about Jesus. They don't go into the whole world. They don't do mission. They don't feed anybody. They don't do social justice. They don't do anything. They kneel down and worship him. The, the Jew is great at worshipping with the whole body. They knelt down. Because so many politicians at the moment appear to be Christians, and some of them probably are, it, it, there's been a lot of discussion lately about Christianity. And somebody said quite, quite succinctly on the, on, the, on the radio, he said, I believe that Christianity is a matter of the way you live your life. And there was a lot of applause. But he was wrong. You read this passage, Christianity is not about the way you live your life. Christianity is about Jesus. Then it is about how you live your life. And when they kneel and hold his feet, we are at the crux of the matter. To meet with Jesus, to meet with Jesus, and to worship him is what you do first. Then you follow where his feet draw. You are my friends if you do what I say. But come here. Come here first. And this morning in our communion, I want you to feel that you, with the bread and the wine, without any fancy metaphysics, are touching Jesus. Spiritually in your hearts, you come to touch Jesus, who is closer than hands and feet. You will all go home, and I pray that you will follow in Jesus' footsteps, that people should know about him, and that we should get busy, that we should become disruptive in this secularized society, that we should get in the way. But before that, that we should kneel. As we take our communion um, this morning, you have an opportunity to actually kneel at the communion rail. If you have arthritis or whatever, you can kneel inside. <laughs> I think that's important. You can kneel anywhere in this building now. But I would encourage you to kneel as we come to communion. To touch with Jesus, to worship him, and then to follow him.